In this episode of the Recover with Colleen podcast, you're going to hear why having a normal childhood, you know, being raised by mostly functional parents who did their best, doesn't prevent you from having issues or struggling with self-control, and how the key to making long-lasting, sustainable, and life-transforming changes is to reprogram your subconscious mind so that you're no longer being jerked around by limiting beliefs that are keeping you stuck in cycles of self-sabotage. I'm Colleen, and this podcast is an inside look at recovery, which I define as a lifelong journey to get out of your own way and become your own best friend. Join me for mindset upgrades that move you from worry and regret to resilience and confidence. I'll share easy strategies for how to feel better without having to make major changes. Because it's not what you do, it's who you are. Self-care is the path to recovery because our needs are not negotiable. Welcome back, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. Today, we're talking about how reprogramming your subconscious mind is the only way to escape the cycles of self-sabotage because trying to control your behavior without fixing the subconscious beliefs that are creating the urge for that behavior is an exercise in futility. And yet that's exactly what we're taught to do, right? Especially if you come from a good home and you were raised to meet and exceed certain expectations, we're rewarded for being good for achieving goals, for telling people what they want to hear. And so we become little performers, you know, performing the role of ourselves in every aspect of our lives, saying and doing and being all the things that are expected of us. But in order to meet those expectations, we had to learn how to suppress the parts of ourselves that are undesirable, to literally disown the parts of ourselves that are not acceptable. Don Miguel Ruiz calls this domestication. So just like a wolf can be domesticated if they're raised from birth so that they are docile and peaceful and safe to be around small children and even birds, we humans are domesticated in childhood so that we are able to meet social and cultural expectations and also be safe to be around small children and even birds. And so we suppress the urges that don't fit in that mold. We try to pretend they don't even exist. And in doing so, our sense of self gets splintered. We believe there is a good part of us and a bad part of us. This is what's referred to as the shadow self. Our shadow consists of all the thoughts and feelings and urges that we're afraid of. We're afraid of parts of ourselves. We're afraid of our own feelings because we have an idea in our head about who we want to be, who we should be, who we need to be. That's our identity, our ego. And any thought or feeling or urge that doesn't fit with that plan that we've set for our lives must be denied. But denying something doesn't make it go away. It simply forces it into the subconscious where we're no longer aware of it. Our brain protects us. Our brain's job is to keep us safe. And when something is in our subconscious, that means that consciously we're not really aware of it, right? It's more of a feeling than a thought, which is why ignoring and suppressing your feelings ends up biting you in the ass. Your feelings are actually useful bits of information. They're alerting you to the crappy beliefs that you formed in childhood when you were in training to be a proper perfectionist. That it's not okay to be angry or tired or to say no or to say something that, God forbid, not everybody agrees with. And those feelings are uncomfortable. And if you're not willing to feel them because you think they mean something is wrong with you, something that there's a part of you that has to be hidden, if you're not willing to feel them and make sense of them and to pull those subconscious beliefs that aren't serving you into consciousness so you can correct them, then you start looking for other ways to make yourself feel better and enter stage left, drinking, eating, shopping, workaholism, people-pleasing, whatever. 
And that's how you end up on the hamster wheel of trying to make yourself feel better with temporary fixes that actually make you feel worse in the long run. And then the worse you feel, the more you beat yourself up because you're operating on the assumption that you actually need to feel bad before you can do better. We talk about this a lot in the next chapter. I often refer to it as shame-based motivation because we were raised to believe that we have to be punished and that negative consequences lead to positive changes, but they don't. And the problem with shame-based motivation is that sure, you may temporarily adjust your behavior, but if you actually succeed, then the shame goes away. And when the shame goes away, the motivation to continue the behavior goes with it. Welcome to the cycles of self-sabotage. And the mistake that we all make is that we are getting cause and effect wrong. We think that our uncontrolled behaviors are responsible for our feelings. First, they make us feel good, then they make us feel bad. But in truth, it's our feelings that are driving our behavior. And once you flip that cause and effect and focus on resolving your emotions first so that you can feel good about who you are and where you are right now, today, not someday when you get everything perfect, that's how you free yourself and you're able to achieve long-lasting change. My guest today is Megan Blacksmith. She's a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner who runs a certification program for neuro-linguistic programming, hypnosis, and the Four Bodies Framework. She's here today to share her own personal journey of recovery, as well as what's involved in the process of reprogramming your subconscious mind. Like, what does that look like? How do you do it? And she's also going to talk about how to see the patterns that are forming and reinforcing your shadow identity. And then she's going to give us some tools to integrate new belief systems into our daily realities. So this isn't something that you're just thinking about. You actually can begin to implement right after this episode. This conversation is not only a deep dive into the root causes of dysfunction, but also a framework for how to accelerate your own recovery. So enjoy the episode. Thank you so much, Megan, for joining me today. I'm really excited to talk to you. Would you start by just sharing a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yes. Thank you for having me, Colleen. I'm excited to be here. So my name is Megan Blacksmith. I'm a co-founder of a company called Zesty, where we help people, a lot of holistic health practitioners, nutritionists, acupuncturists, people who are coaches, people who are helping other people get healthy. We help them learn how to add tools to rewire their brain, subconscious reprogramming, for those of you who've heard of that in a way to really quickly get to results. So we're all about transformation, although we like it in an accelerated way. Cause I don't know about you, Colleen, but the slow painful way is the way I personally went and we like to help people speed it up. That it's funny that you should say that because I'm in a program right now for podcasting and I'm thinking about, not saying I'm doing this, but I'm thinking about changing the name of my podcast to Accelerated Recovery because exactly to your point, I feel like I spent three years just kind of in all the pitfalls and running around the wrong mountains. And there is, when you go directly into your subconscious and identify the limiting beliefs, you really can accelerate your recovery. Like, I don't know how else to put it. So I really appreciate you saying that. Do you want to share a little bit about what you're in recovery from and what it means to recover and your journey? Absolutely. So there's two kind of halves to this story of my own because I have a husband, a partner who went through an official recovery as in like a rehab type program for alcohol. But the interesting part about that story is that when he went into this process and he went into recovery and started his process of understanding recovery and addiction is actually when I went into my own. So I didn't quite realize until things hit that rock bottom of, and I share about this very openly on our own podcast. I have a whole story about how I found out he was having an affair and then within 24 hours found out he was like, I am an alcoholic and I need to go get help. And I had no idea how bad it was. I just had no idea. And now looking back, there were lots and lots of signs and 
all the questions I'd ask of like, is that a normal amount to be drinking? I always got the like, you know, I'm, I'm Native American and I'm a big guy and he was in the military and, you know, it's like, yeah, this is just nothing. And I was questioning it. There was that little thought there, although I just never really let myself go there because I honestly just didn't believe I could handle it. I didn't believe I would know what to do. We had two children and I was like, this just, this just can't be true. So I ignored all the thoughts and I ignored all the signs, just kind of pushed them under. And so in the process of discovering that this actually was a problem, it had been a problem for many years, I also started to realize that my patterns of people pleasing, my patterns of pushing things under the rug, my patterns of thinking, if I just ignore this, it will go away. If I just pretend we don't have a problem, if I just pretend, oh, it's normal, we have a baby, we've been sleeping in a different room for a year. If I just pretend all these things are totally fine, then it will eventually work itself out and go away. That was what I was hoping for, praying for. And I had the moment where discovering he really had a problem that I really had a problem. I had allowed lots of signs. I had, I had overridden my, my intuition over and over and over again in, in order to just keep the peace. Mm -hmm. So my recovery from that journey journey was from people pleasing. It was from codependency. It was from the idea that somehow I believed I wouldn't be able to handle the emotions, the beliefs, anything that came up if I were to actually look at the problem and not run from it. So his moment and what we've discovered and, you know, in a way him going through the process he went through, I started to really read on and I was in at the time helping women directly with hormone health and we tested brain chemistry. So I went deep into the brain part of this and, and learned really quickly, okay, it's going to take him two years for his brain to recover from his serotonin and his dopamine. And I was looking into what was this act this path actually going to look like and as i kept reading i was like oh this is my brain this is exactly what i'm going to go through and this is the kind of timeline so i think because i went deep into the research and was already in the field of holistic health and he was in a place where he went away for 30 days so i was able to actually have some time and space we created a process for both of us and then everything I learned for myself, I, you know, then ended up teaching to the coaches and practitioners we help and everything that he learned, he brought back as well. So it kind of became this intertwined journey to recovery that we both went through together. So I always have to acknowledge that, you know, it takes two to put the fun in a dysfunctional relationship. And oh, yeah. I know from my own marriage and my own problems that I, my, what do they say? You point one finger out and three fingers are pointing back. Can you describe the symptoms or the actual thoughts that you had in your head that rose into your awareness where you were able to take responsibility for how you were showing up in the relationship? Because, you know, I can imagine that if my husband was having an affair and admitted to being an alcoholic, especially if I'm used to being a people pleaser and I want to make my marriage work or save, save it for the baby's sake, that I would be all about helping him. What gave you the awareness that you yourself needed to change? Like, was it reading? Like, how, how did you know that you had changing to do? So I think I was really driven. I'm not even think, sure I put this together until you asked this question. I think I was really driven, honestly, by like the physical body. So in our company, we talk about all four bodies and how it's really important to be addressing the mental and the emotional, physical, the energetic. But I was really aware because I had worked with so many women with for hormone health and I had been through a health journey where I myself, that it was a real struggle that I knew, I know what stress does to the body and I know like physical stress and I know what an event like this could have done to me. So I went into this with like, okay, there were a lot of things that happened that got us here. I ignored a lot of things. He made a lot of choices and I was like, I will not. 
when he left, I was like, I will not allow this to take down my physical body and my health. Cause at that point I had gotten my hormone health back. I was in a great functioning state and I hadn't been earlier on. So I was like, okay, I know what it's like to be lying on the floor, having panic attacks and be in this really horrible place that I was in postpartum. And I was like, I will not go back there over this. <laughs> right. So I had this drive of, from the second he left, I was like, okay, how do I make my self-care top of the list? And I really did. I, I treated myself just like I was in the same recovery. I was like going in and I was getting IVs and I went into float tanks and I was doing anything. I knew where my brain was going to go. Like this was a very intense shift in my model of what I thought our world was. This was, I had two small children and I was like, what the hell am I going to do? I really didn't quite know. But what I did know is that I was not allowing my body to go down with it. And in from that focus kind of on supporting the physical body, I think that gave me enough clarity that I could step back and start to look at my own beliefs and my own patterns. And I did when he, as soon as he left, I kind of went into research mode. I was like, I've got to understand this. So like you said, Colleen, I did read a ton of books. I wanted to understand how the brain works because for me, when it's a little bit more brain-based, it allows me to say like, you know what? he had really, really strong early life trauma and he is Native American and from this tribe where this was totally normal. And so I was starting to see that it was easy for me to point the finger at him, but like the things were stacked against him in this manner. And when I could see it as a brain based situation that I saw as temporary because my belief, the more I read was like, this is trauma based. This isn't him. This isn't identity. This is trauma based. And so I was like, we can actually, we can actually get through this. And so the more I read, the more I feel like that, that started to stack up. So I had hope. Yeah. Can you explain what you mean by brain based? Are you talking about brain chemistry? Are you talking about thoughts? Obviously, those probably lead to behavior patterns, but I'm also a fellow nerd and I like to read and all of that. But can you just maybe expand on that a little bit that when you looked at him and you, you could see that it's brain-based and you also bring in the word trauma, which makes room for compassion and forgiveness, but what does that actually mean in terms of recovery? Yeah. So what I started to read and understand really quickly was that early life trauma, which I had was already aware that he had an extreme amount of it, will lead to changes in the physical brain in then how we're how we are processing and interacting with our world and how we do things to drive for a dopamine hit. And it will then actually change our actions. So then the trauma itself then we create, there's all sorts of beliefs we're creating around that as well. So it is like the physical brain chemistry. And then we get into whatever the addiction is, which then depletes that even more, depletes our nutrients. So we can't even make the things in our brain that we needed to keep a healthy. And then there's the beliefs, whatever the situation was that was really bad enough, there's the beliefs that came with that. I mean, if you're a small child and people are doing horrible things to you, it, it's hard to make up any other reason, but like, it's because I'm a, I'm a bad person. It's because I'm not worthy of being on this earth. It's because people don't care about me. So then you combine that. It's a compounding effect of like the, the beliefs that are arise from that that are stored there, whether you even remember the trauma or not, but the beliefs around how safe the world is how how much you need to be on alert right so like if the world is bad and everybody's out to get there get you you're on alert and you're p- constantly pumping out right cortisol and the stress response which then goes comes around again and breaks down all the good stuff in your body so you get in this really really tricky loop and then the only thing that made him feel better would be to drink to kind of numb, numb yourself from that feeling of like, why did that stuff happen to me? And why does it happen? And why are we here? And so I kind of think it's all, it's all of it, Colleen. It was, it was an accumulation of all the different aspects that I just started to see really clearly. Like I see how we got here. 
And when yeah. I could see how we got here, I was like, then to me, there's, there's a way, there's a way out. What about your own habits about, like you said, people pleasing? I mean, th- just that right there. What, what about your brain? How, how did that stuff form? You know, I know for myself, I didn't have a traumatic childhood. I have wonderful, loving parents who, yeah, they weren't perfect, but I wouldn't trade them. I wouldn't trade my life or my childhood. And yet I still found myself, you know, on the wrong end of the bottle. And so when you look at your own life and speaking to your own recovery, what what causes just maybe more of a normal childhood and person. And I don't know, you haven't said that whether or not your childhood was normal, but can you just speak to your own brain-based stuff that, that created this relationship where it was dysfunctional? Oh yeah. I love this question. This is so good because I do, I would put myself into the category that you are in more of like the like I called it the small town cookie cutter family and everything seemed great. And I really did question, really question later in life where I was making lots and lots of choices, um, choosing to drink a lot or whether it was drugs or promiscuity, whatever it was. I remember being like, I honestly don't quite know why I'm doing those things because I didn't feel like I had a reason. Like I didn't have anything bad happen to me. And when I was pregnant with my first child, I remember just crying uncontrollably, uncontrollably. And that was my thought process. I was like, okay, if I had good parents and like, I still have gone through and done some of the stuff and struggled in the way that I have, I was like, how the heck am I ever going to be a good parent for this child? I don't, I really was like, I don't know how that's going to work because I couldn't see anything on paper that anybody had done in my family that would make me then end up doing some of the things. And I, I didn't eating distor- disorder. I was bulimic in college, things like that, where I was like, on pa- this doesn't quite make sense to me on paper why I'm doing this. And at the same time, what I have found from working with many, many women, I mean, wor- working with everyone, but we work with a lot more women is that it kind of doesn't matter what your actual childhood setup is, whether it's like big T trauma, like there's a really large event that everybody knows about or, or smaller things. It's really our perception of what's going on. It's our perception of whether we're loved. And there's, I I don't want to say this to scare anybody because they're like, great, well, you can never get out of it. But like small things, we can make a decision. And we've had people make decisions about small things where like their sister was the one who got to sleep in the bed with their parents. And they're too little to really understand like why that was necessary and what was happening. And that person was sick, et cetera. And they can just decide like, I am not good enough. I am not as loved as her. Like I've had the situation where I've had a lot of women we work with in health and they, they have the belief that they got more love when they were sick. Right. So that was the one time that mom and dad were like, anything you want, stay home, lay in bed, be cozy with me, like really taking care of them. And we're not consciously going around. I want to, I want to be sick. Although that was part of my healing journey. I wasn't getting better until I discovered, like I actually believed I was getting more love and support. I was, I was like, people were making me dinner. My husband was driving the kids to school. So there's these beliefs there that get formed that don't really have to be from anything extreme. And actually the pattern that I see is almost, I don't know about you, Colleen. I don't know if you were a really good student, but I was like a really good straight A student. I went to college for mechanical engineering. I did that for 10 years and it was like, oh, most, there aren't many women in this, right? There was, it was very this, like, you get love when you are smart in an academic way and you follow the check boxes. And I learned that. And I think sometimes the people we see that are really, really good at that, like the, almost the better they are at the check boxes, the worse they are really like listening to themselves and their intuition, because they were so mm-hmm. driven by being that really good athlete or that really good student. And I have seen many people that we work with that fall into, you know, addiction or whether it is a health concern or whether it is just not really doing that well in their business, because there is this like perfectionist people pleasing threat that runs through every single thing that they do. And it didn't come from like a big event. It just came from a life of learning. Honestly, 
And I do not blame my parents at all because it was almost just like you got great positive feedback for doing well in school. doesn't seem like there could be much wrong with that. <laughs> right. It shouldn't be that traumatic. But no, I was the same way. I'm a box check checker. I'm an A-plus student. You know, triple A, actually. If you could give me three A's, I'd be great. And I think it's just how we learn how to get love and approval. I think it's human It's behavior. It's human behavior. You know, we all learn what it takes to be safe and to survive and to get what we get our needs met. Yeah. And we pick up on like the beliefs of the people around us really quickly. And I know, so as I've studied language and now we, we, you know, we teach people neuro-linguistic programming. So it's all about studying language. And as I study language more and more, I do listen to like the people who are around me, like parents or grandparents or mentors. And, and now I can hear it in their language as like, oh, there was, there was nothing outwardly being said about you have to be this way, but, but it is implicit in the language. And if that is our survival is we believe it's totally based on being part of the community, staying in the tribe, right? Not getting Mm -hmm. kicked out, especially from our primary caregivers or the teachers or our parents. And so like we will get really, really good at really, really good at doing what, what other people say or doing what you're supposed to. It's the black and white thinking, which can just, it can get us into a lot of trouble when you introduce, um, yeah, other things. So talk to me a little bit about whether it be your recovery or bridge it into kind of how you help people recover. It's one thing to see the black and white thinking and the perfectionistic mindset. And I can just check all those boxes all day long every day, but actually reprogramming your subconscious, like, can you talk to me about how that's possible? And maybe even circle back to the fact that there's an accelerated way to do it? Yeah. So, okay. So what we have found is that the structure we work with right now is in in in-person trainings mostly. So we'll do seven day, six or seven day trainings. Sometimes we do two day events too, but for the longer trainings, it's six or seven days. And the accelerated portion is that when you get into a room like that, you are out, you're in a different environment. So whatever, everything I'm saying, this doesn't mean you have to come to our training to be a different environment, but just think about where can you go and be in a very different environment? Cause that's going to help you rewire the brain really quickly. Otherwise, if you're getting up, seeing the same people every day, having the same thoughts every day, getting out of the same side of the bed every day, brushing your teeth the same way. And then not only that, but I know for like my business partner who had chronic pain, when you've had chronic pain your whole lifetime, or you've had addiction your whole lifetime, the people around you interact with you like you have that and they're reinforcing that. So they're going like, Oh, are you sure you want to wear that? Like, are you, can you really ride that bike? Like, remember that pelvic pain thing. And so when you're in a different environment and people don't know that <laughs> there's a really fast chance to make a decision of like, I'm, I'm going to be a different identity. I'm going to be a different person. So just that one piece alone, getting out there, getting somewhere else And when you know you're going to be gone for an extended period of time, that does allow you to have the comfort of like, most people know I am going to have to kind of go into some stuff. Like I am going to have to dig a little bit. When you feel like there's an opening though, it feels safe. If you're on like an hour long call, I do a lot of the processes I do for subconscious reprogramming. You can do it over Zoom in a call and people only go so deep because they're like, you're your family's right outside the door, right? Like, right. I'm not going to open open up this whole trauma that, of whatever it is when I know I'm going right back. But when you have the space and the time, we find people go really deep really quickly and they can clear it really quickly because it's a safe, a totally safe container. So the accelerated part is that you're in a different environment. The other thing about the environment though, is it brings up these patterns. So you can say, you were saying, Colleen, like, okay, I'm aware of the people pleasing and I'm aware of the checkbox, right? But when you come into a training room or when you come into an event like this, you basically your patterns are being shown to you really, really clearly because this, these will be the people who are immediately like, oh, hey, like where's the, where's the very detailed schedule of exactly what we're doing when, right? And so we get to, as, the pro, as we go through the process, we get to kind of mirror back like, hey, did you know, did you notice this is a pattern, right? Or like, 
we do actually have a test that's a part of our certification. And we get to see like our, our perfectionists. We get to see like who's waiting till the last minute. We get to see like who's feeling like it's never done no matter how much they do or who's read 80 books when you maybe could have just Googled it, right? So like we, you get to see the pattern and there's no right or wrong. It's just that's your pattern. But you do have the chance to break that pattern because every single time we do a process where we're rewiring for something else, we will then decide what are we going to do? We call it tasking. But what are we going to do in the next three days, seven, within, you know, within a week to secure in this new identity. So if you just cleared the belief that I'm not worthy of love and you now believe you are totally worthy of love or you're totally worthy of a great business or you're totally worthy of feeling good in your body. Now, what is that person? What is the person with that identity? What are they going to go do? What would they be doing this week? They already have the belief. You have the belief. And then we're picking some little action item, something that can represent that. A lot of times those steps might be like, Sometimes they involve physical things like someone will buy something like if they're like, I'm successful, they'll buy, I don't know, their branded pair of shoes or something. And then they can now now you're seeing it every day, like you're seeing it in your closet and it's reminding you like, oh, yes, I am that identity. And so we get to secure that loop in pretty quickly when you have time away, tools to actually rewire the brain. That's a whole bunch of different tools you can use and then something to lock it in because if you go right back to your life and you mm -hmm. do not change anything you you will un unwire everything you just rewire it, it won't stick it's it's not I mean it is I do feel like it's magic but it's not fully magic it's the we just did we just had the huge aha you know we had the the brain blowing emoji. And now we do have to say, I'm going to go live that because we've, we've had people who come in, have a huge aha, and they go right back to the old thing. So that is a possibility. And that's where the choice is. It's always a choice. What does it look like to go back in? Because I imagine that what you're saying applies on different levels of a spectrum. Like I might not go do a week long subconscious rewiring program, mm -hmm. but even I, I, okay, I go to a group call and I really have a deeper breakthrough and I get it. And then call goes off. I go right back into my regular environment and pretty soon the aha moment is gone. Like I use this analogy that you can have a light bulb moment, but if your light bulb's not plugged in, it's not going to stay on. <laughs> so what does it look like to take an epiphany or an awareness or a learning where you have rewired your subconscious, but what does it look like to take it and go walk, talk and feel with it in real life? Yeah. Well, I think each person has to kind of learn to know themselves in how are they going to make that change happen? Like, how are they going to stick to the thing that they said they're going to do? So that's starting to get to know yourself. So if I go to a business event, that's a two day business event, I always have the third day I take off to be integration day. Cause I know I'm going to learn a ton, but like, when am I going to implement it? So if you know that you just went to a call and you know, you always learn something on this call, can you set yourself up to have an hour after that, where you're going to actually schedule it? You're going to actually put it in your phone as a reminder. You're going to get an accountability buddy. I always have a coach because I know I do great with that external accountability and I know they're going to call. We're going to be on the phone in two weeks and they're going to say, did you do the thing? Right? Yeah. I, I want to pin that. Like if, if we had a highlighter, the word integration, I think as a person who voraciously reads and consumes content and listens to podcasts and does all the things. And I've got a team of professional coaches. I think that where I may fall short is exactly what you're speaking of, the integration. So talk to me about what it looks like to integrate after this podcast, walking away and realizing, okay, I need to rewire my subconscious. Some things made sense. What does it look like to actually pause and integrate? So you're just going to be speaking to all of us out there, me included, who are good at learning, Colleen, right? The people who are good at learning and love to learn and love like that juicy nugget, right? That like really does light up our dopamine of like, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that's how the brain worked, right? Love those books. So 
I will answer your question about the podcast, but for people who read like that, one of the things that I started implementing was anytime I read a book, I would have to pick, not have to, I chose to pick three specific things that I was going to do from that book before I read the next one. And then again, I'm going to schedule them in. So I'm like, what did I learn from this? And And obviously, you know, they say when we teach it, we learn it the best. So if you can like Mm -hmm. really integrate it by teaching it to someone else, someone in your life or if you're a coach, but teaching it, what can I, how can I share these three things? And then how am I going to hold myself accountable? Is it going to be me and my own phone? Is it going to be sticky notes everywhere? Is it going to be my partner? Is it going to be a coach? But something where, you know, I'm going to do the thing. (laughs) I'm going to do the thing. I just, and not a lot of things. You could even pick one. I think the the overwhelm comes when we're like, there were 80 new things in there. What am, what am I going to do? Right. So picking one. So after you're listening to this podcast, I w- I'm guessing people, there's part of my story or something you shared calling that's like, oh, that really stuck with me. Yeah. That's a pattern. Right. So if mm-hmm. you, if a pattern called out to you and you're like, that's what I do, I'm people pleasing all the time, then committing it, the easiest question is just ask, what do you want to believe instead? Who do you want to be instead? So, okay. I want to be a person who does what's best for me and really, really checks in. Like, is this good for me? Is this good with me? Okay. Now, if I'm that person, what am I going to do? What am I going to put in place that now the next time somebody asks me to do something, I will check in with, is this actually good for me? I love systems and I love framework. So I actually created a, it's a really simple process, but I created a process for this because I had a friend who asked me, hey, would you watch my son on Saturday morning and whatever? And I was like, oh gosh, in my head, I'm like, the night before my kids were going to be doing this really late thing. It would require me to get up early. It was actually going to require a lot from me. And I didn't really know why she was asking or where this was coming from. And so the people pleaser part of me is like, she asked me, I should say yes. (laughs) Like, and I was like, I am, no, I'm going to be resentful because I, I I know I'm going to put myself in a place where I don't really want to do this. Luckily it's a great friend. So I was able to be like, Hey, can we talk more about this? Like, what is the need? Like, why are you asking this? Tell me a little bit more about it because depending on whether it's like, I'm going to be going to a wedding that I wouldn't be able to go to if you don't do this and I have nobody else to ask, then like, it's yes. Right. So I've got more backstory and she's like, oh no, she's like, it's no big deal at all. I have like three other people I could ask. You were just the first one because my, her son and my daughter play really well. So if I had not told her, Hey, this just happens to be this actually does take a lot out of me based on the time. Cause normally when, when I have him over after school, it's actually a win-win because my, the kids get to play. I usually get more time to myself and I, and I love both of them. So it, it, right. It's very situation dependent. So I actually created this little chart and I was like, what, what energetic exchange, like how high is this for me to do this exercise? Like, is it a positive 10? Like it actually helps me or is it a negative three? Like this would take a lot out of me. So then we can also look at like, what's the energetic exchange and then what need or value is it meeting for me? So if it was like low on the energy, like it would take energy out of me, but then I was like, but it was really important to her. So it would meet me high on the connection and community. Like it's a 10 on, she really needed it and I could help her and add those up. And I was like, all right, 10 minus three, we're still at a positive, positive seven. I'll do it. But if it's like, Negative three, it would totally deplete me. And negative three is not even going to meet a value of me. It's not going to really help her and me, which is this. And so I didn't do it. And she called her other babysitter. (laughs) I wish, so I have four plus three kids. And I can remember saying yes once and then feeling bad and really never saying no again. And I can remember when I was able to quit my job because my husband had good health insurance and I had a girlfriend who didn't, and we were both teachers. And I literally took her kids like I were on a daycare because I felt bad that she had to go back to work and I didn't. And basically spent a year completely stressing myself. I mean, I had four of my own little kids and every day I took her two or three, depending on other things, because I was a people pleaser. And you know, I now look back and I just see how how that didn't help her either because I was resentful and angry and 
it's just amazing when you really look at people pleasing, it doesn't actually save the planet. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. My business partner, Dr. Alex says that people pleasing is actually one of the most selfish things you can do. <gasps> oh, right. really? Because <laughs> If you think about it, Colleen, we're usually people pleasing because we don't want to feel bad. So we are saying, I'm going to do this thing so that I can be on the right side of it and I don't have to have any emotions. And then I'm going to be kind of resentful towards you when usually that person doesn't necessarily even know because <laughs> they just asked a question, which wasn't actually did have an option to it. And we took it as like, well, they asked, I have to do it. And so then if we're holding resentment towards them, if we're angry about towards them, or like, gosh, I always take your kids and, and you never take mine. And then we basically just did that. We did that. So we felt okay. It really wasn't about them. It was like, I don't want to have to feel that emotion. And the more people I get around me, like my friend who was able to say like, let's talk about this. I actually, this would be a big ask. And the more we're able to just... She was just like, oh, cool. And I, in the past, I just, I would never have even thought to have that conversation with somebody. <laughs> it would yeah. just be like, I would either, in the past, I would either like make something up, make like, yeah. you know, one up them of like, oh, well, I'm struggling even more. So I can't take your kids yeah. or just done it. Not just said like, hey, I mean, that the, the famous line, like my mom, my mom is in her seventies and she's like, it's really cool. You can just say that doesn't work for me. Isn't that cool? Yeah. yeah. No, I said yes to everything. And you, you mentioned bulimia. I was still throwing up when I was almost 40 because I, that, and I can remember actually purging and like literally screaming into the toilet because I had self-silenced so, so mm. much and didn't know how to get out of it. So can you talk about what recovery looks like for a people pleaser? Like, okay, so I go to my week or I do what I can, you know, I'm, I'm spending hours reading or listening to podcasts and I'm doing my integration. Okay. Now I'm pinning a note to myself. So there's a Google alert in my brain. Every time I get this feeling that's alerting me to maybe do this, this test that you're saying, you know, measure the negatives, measure the positives and, and really look at it from a more objective point of view. But how long does this take over time? You know, what does it look like to recover? Are you ever recovered? And what are the pitfalls? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it's a great question. I don't, I don't know, actually, like from a science space, I don't know, but I'm guessing I'm wondering if it is along the two year time frame of the same, the same cycle, it takes the brain to recover from other substances, because this is like an imbalance in our brain chemistry, because we've gotten so much kudos for doing the people right, we get, we get a hit from that, we get something from doing the things that didn't, you know, that were just for other people. So I would say I think probably is going to be a lifelong process where I kind of have to check in. It gets getting easier and easier, though, honestly, because I I understand now that it isn't serving me or them in the long run. Although there's times where I was like, huh, well, I did just I guess I won't go to that. And I'll have a minute of like, am I going to get judged? Am I, are they going to think I'm selfish? So you kind of still have those old like beliefs come up and then I'm able to much more quickly just go, well, okay, well, I'll be able to help well, I, more people. I want to put that into context too. You know, even people pleasing, yes, we're avoiding the feeling, but we're also going for the quick dopamine hit that we're going to get when we say yes. And that's going to make us feel good. So it's a short term instant gratification. Yeah. And then we're paying long term. And so to speak to your point, rewiring the dopamine so that you get the reward by stopping, you know, really evaluating and then making a good decision that serves you long term, even though you have to do the uncomfortable thing up front, that is actually rewiring the brain. That's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. Rewiring your dopamine so that you're motivated to take the pain hit up front and then, you know, make sure that all your, you're not going crazy in two weeks because you've given away all your time and energy. Right. Anytime you stop and do a different pattern, you are rewiring the brain. So our goal is that people will have lots of tools. So if we're talking about physical body, then we have to think about like 
tools like to calm the body, like to get into parasympathetic and get out of fight or flight. So this can be actual tools like deep breathing, meditation, or just really simple ones like tapping, chest thumping, that tapping in the middle of your chest will help you get into parasympathetic. There's, you know, I, I know a lot of you can't see me, but there's, they call it the lotion where you're actually just, you know, Havening. right. Yeah. So you're just brushing your arms. Right. So, that, so we teach people to get some physical tools, something that you can do so that when you are having that feeling like oh, I need to do the thing I was just asked to do that you can pause and actually physically calm the body, right? Like get your, get yourself to a more calm state so that then you can, then you can make a decision. So you have the tools to physically calm the body. And then the next set would be to have the tools to to actually process some emotions. So if it's super activating, right? Like you said you were like screaming into the toilet while vomiting. That is one of the tools we teach of like, if you have anger in there, if you never really got to like push back on something or we, need, we might need to go out and do some activating exercises where you do yell, primal scream, where you do push, where you do punch, where you break some stuff, right? To, to actually let those emotions come out because many of us have just been like, emotions are bad, keep them in no matter what they are. So if we're able to calm the physical body, we're able to move the emotion, then we're going to be able to make a different choice. I know when I first, I've been working from home, but my husband retired from the military two years ago. So all of a sudden, like he's in the home with me. And Mm -hmm. I realized, I guess, I guess this is people pleasing, but it was also like the belief that, you know, working hard makes you worthy too. So I had that one too. So if I was ever like taking a break, Colleen, like if I was like, you know what, it's the middle of the day, but I'm actually just going to lie here or read a book or, you know, heaven forbid, like watch a show. If I heard him like coming in the house from outside, I would like jump up (laughs) and go to my computer because I was just like, I I have to be. the same thing. I even watch TV in my basement because I don't want my neighbors to see that my TV's on. Because I'm not the type of person that watches TV. I read books and do all the other stuff. And I catch myself doing that. And I'm like, first of all, zero, zero people care what you're doing. But I I do this. If I hear my husband's car come in the garage, I often override the impulse. But usually my impulse is to make it look like I'm, you know, working or doing something. Like I'm not worthy of just sitting there. Right. It's so sad. And it is for pointing that out because it I is it's such too. it's been one that I really had to actively work on and I even had the conversation with my husband I was like hey this is a thing I'd really like to rewire it so if you have people in your life that are open to that kind of conversation then you can actually say next time you come home I'm gonna sit on the tv like like I mean whatever their feelings are about it if fine if it is actually a problem to them that's a different scenario but when I, most of the time, it's really not a problem to them. It's, it's a problem with us that we decided they have a problem so they can help you. They'll be like, if you could just come in and like smile at me and I go, Oh, look, I didn't die. And nobody's upset with me and I can watch TV. But over time I was able to rewire that because like, as the success of our business grew and as I started to really tap into my belief is like, I know that I do better in business when I have way more white space and rest time. And it's true. It's like the more I've done that and implemented that and the less of the checklisty thing, the more money we've made. So now mm-hmm. it's like a joke. I'm like, watch me nap. I'm making money right now. Like, you know, it's just, <laughs> you, you start to rewire it. And that's like the confidence that's come with working in that way. But so now, now it's just a big old joke, but gosh, just two years ago, that was like, yeah, that was a thing. I wanted Have him you ever to seen- leave so that I didn't ha- like. I was like, "Well, yeah. why are you here during the day anyway?" Because <laughs> I wanted to be able to do whatever I wanted to do instead of just becoming okay with doing what that's. I to do. And I work with so many women who deal with the same thing, and I think we don't even realize that underneath it is we're just uncomfortable existing. We're uncomfortable existing where we're not performing, and so if somebody's around, then we've got to put on a show of some sort, and yet we all complain or we look at our husbands, not complain, but we look at our husbands. Does, has any man ever jumped up in the middle of a football game and tried to act like they were cleaning the refrigerator? Is that a thing (laughs) that men talk about on their podcasts? (laughs) I I haven't seen it. (laughs) Right. Let's channel that. Like, let's just channel like, yeah, I'm just, I'm just watching this and I'm hanging out here. Right. Yeah. 
And I want to just highlight what you said about when you get the evidence that changing is actually going to move you forward, that is where I think the motivation to continue really comes. Like I know I catch myself in these overwhelms and tasks that I'm doing. And I know the moment I catch myself in overwhelm, oh, okay, I got to go. Like, you know, the the program we're both in, it, he says, start with a blank piece of paper. And the minute I realize I've rewritten the same email 15 times, the more I'm like, oh, wait, stop. Like, and not giving myself enough rest, saying yes when I really mean no. Like in the end, all people are better my life is better. My business is better. My kids are better when I'm honest, ask the hard questions, and then make decisions that actually serve me. And these beliefs that we grew up with, that the only way we can get love is to Mm -hmm. not mention that we have to go potty right now. Like how many times do I like not do what I need to do because I have to potty and I'm not, I don't want to admit or stop or whatever. I mean, it's just kind of sad. And so I guess you know, what does your life look like now in terms of daily habits? Is there anything we haven't discussed that you do on a regular basis that is an example of, you know, living in this in integrated way? I'd say that I've allowed for a lot of flexibility. So the flexibility is something that is harder for my checklist, the old checklist thinking, right? Of like, well, I'll get up and I'll schedule my whole day and this will be how it is. And so I have this ebb and flow of the day where I really do check in like on each kind of segment of the day of like, okay, is this actually a time where it's like, I'm feeling good and I want to go do some stuff, create some content, whatever. Of course, if I have client calls and those are just scheduled, but other than that, and then being able to really be honest and be like, you know what, today is a day where I, all I have in me is like a walk and like to listen to something or or I love puzzles. That's kind of like my mindless meditation practice. Like today is going to be a puzzle day because what I used to do was push through and go to the checklist no matter what. And then I would find one, two, three days of that. And I'd be sick. I'd be burnt out. I'd be, I wouldn't want to do anything. And I really still do. I still push back when I have a day where I don't don't feel like doing stuff. I'm like, oh, this is so annoying. Like I don't want it. And I have seen the pattern enough. Like you said, there's been enough evidence that if I can just be like, okay, you know what? Calling off what we're planning. I am going to walk down to the ocean today. I'm going to meet a friend for tea today and do something different. That has had the biggest impact because then it's the next day where I like have this genius idea just kind of flow through me. And I'm like, like Paige, I could have never forced that, right? Yeah. So before we end, would you mind putting a putting a bow on the story with you and your husband? How did that turn out? I mean, it sounds like you're still married, but can you just before and after how many years it's been and and what how that turned out? We are still married. We made it through that. That led for me, that was the impetus for me to start to look into brain change. So I went to two weeks of neurofeedback. I started to learn subconscious reprogramming. So, you know, as much as we can say, I am really grateful for the opportunity. It was horrible at the time. And I do see, I do see what happened. I do see where that went because now I am really, really doing 100% what I love. And, And that led to it. That was a big shifting point. For him, what's been really cool is that from the very beginning, we went at this of like a long term change and not really necessarily looking for like he can never drink again or, you know, this is like a lifelong sentence. We don't use the word alcoholic in our house. Like we don't, we just don't say that with people. And he, I think he went. I think he went to one AA meeting ever and he, what he was willing to do though was get trauma support and he was willing to do physical brain support and he was really, he was really willing to go all in. So between that, I mean, since then it's been five years and I just said to him the other day, I was like, Hey, it's been like, or maybe it's been six years. I was like, you've been, and I was like, you've been soberish for for five or six years. And he's like soberish. That's funny. Cause what, what has ended up happening, I'd say about once or twice a year, 
we'll go to a fancy restaurant, the two of us, and we'll decide to have a bottle of wine. And the coolest thing has been that that does now, I mean, we didn't do that in the first year or two, but now that does not open up anything for him. That does not lead him to wanting it again the next day. It just, it's just a one-time event and we move on from it. And I think that has been just really cool to see that we're, we're not creating this super identity around it of like this problem and this buffer and everybody needs to be aware of it. And, you know, people know, like when they come to a dinner party at our house, we're like, if you want some alcohol, bring it. Like we did, we don't have it, but bring it if you want it. And it's been a really cool process to see that it's not an all or nothing. I'm really happy early on. I found some people who like you, who were saying it's just not an all or nothing. And we had, we went addressed it that way. And I feel like we have a way, way better, better relationship than I think we ever would have. It, it brought us to the depths of work where we've done multiple couples retreats, the two of us to go deep into processing this. We did a process where we actually dumped the bucket. I said everything to him that I was ever angry at in the world. And he said everything to me. And like, we fully buried it and, and it was done. Like once you say it, it was done. So we've done some really cool process that if it hadn't been that bad, I don't, those aren't things that people, regular people want to sign up for. Like it sounded absolutely horrible. Yeah. <laughs> And well, powerful. if it hadn't been that bad, it can't, it couldn't be this good. Yeah. And that's, that's just the, the yin and the yang. If it doesn't Absolutely. get that bad, you know, and I look at things in my life, you know, coming up that what if this gets that bad? And it's like, the worse it gets, the better it gets. So this fear, you know, it's really hard to trust free fall into the universe and be like, okay, I'm going to trust this, but truly you know, the, the growth and the wisdom and the resilience that we gain going through these things. I mean, who would you be if, if that all that hadn't happened? Still people pleasing and in Absolutely. a relationship where it's not authentic and real. Like how cool that you and your husband can talk about all of this and hold space. How cool is it that you're in a relationship with a man who you can say, I'm working on sitting on the couch when you come home watching TV. If you could give me positive feedback and help me rewire my subconscious. I mean, that's just the ultimate comfort, comfortable relationship to be able to be that transparent. It's, it's very oh. cool. And I do not take it for granted. Yeah. Can you just, before we go, first of all, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story and your insight and your professional expertise. Can you tell our listeners, you know, maybe where to find you or if you have anything that you're doing? I think you mentioned you have a two-day live event. Tell me about that in case I want to get on that oh, point. do. And actually, Colleen, I'm happy to give away a free ticket to your, to your audience if you'd, if you'd like to do that. All right. Well, somebody, how do we do that? Somebody who leaves a review for you on your podcast? Yes. 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 Let's do that. Okay. There you go. So we're doing mm -hmm. a two-day event in January. So January 19th and 20th. It is in Virginia Beach, Virginia. That's where I live. We do this twice a year, sometimes Dallas, sometimes Virginia Beach. But this is a, it's called Habit Transformation with the Accelerator. There's that word, Accelerator. We're going to go two days into habit change. So from all four body perspective, from a rewiring of the brain, dropping beliefs that are stopping us from habits. And habits is actually like the sixth out of seventh step for us. So we think there's a lot of things that happen before you actually get to like changing the physical habit. Because if you don't change all the, the beliefs under that and the identity under that, we see that it just doesn't stick. So a lot of us want to jump in at just the habit change, right? Like I'll put my shoes by the door to work out or I'll like not buy the sugar and not eat it. But to us, there's a lot more that comes before that for habit change. So we're going to walk through that. It's an amazing group of, we, we attract coaches, we attract leaders, practitioners, we attract entrepreneurs who really want to up-level and integrate habit change. So that would be found at becomingzesty.com forward slash Jan, like J-A-N. And then we can. Okay. I'll put that in the show notes. So Becoming Zesty, that's the name of your podcast. Is that who yes. you are on Instagram and other socials? Yep. Yep. Becoming Zesty on Instagram. And that is our new website. And that is the podcast. All, All the right. things. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Colleen. 
And thank you for joining me for another episode of the Recover with Colleen podcast. Check the note, show notes for links to Megan, both her podcast and her upcoming events. And then if you like the show, please hit the subscribe button if you haven't already and share the episode with a friend or post it on your socials if you found it helpful. And if you are loving the show, I would so appreciate if you take the time, if you're on Apple Podcasts, to hit go to my homepage, scroll down past all the episodes, and then leave me a review. That helps so much boost my appearance in search engines. And then if you want to follow me on Instagram, find me at Recover with Colleen. And then if you are not on my email list, in the show notes, I have a link. I send one email per week, plus uh, any announcements I have about upcoming events, like next Sunday, October 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern, I am offering my first of three recovery storytelling workshops, which are designed to help you heal your subconscious limiting beliefs by expanding the story you're telling yourself, expanding your identity so that you can make room for the whole person, acknowledging the good and the bad and move forward in life so that you're no longer stuck in a single moment perspective and the knowledge you had that creates trauma. We are going to be doing this over every two weeks for the next three weekends. I don't have the registration page ready yet at the time that I'm posting this episode, but I will be sending it to my email subscribers. So if you're not on my list, click the link in the show notes and subscribe. I do not get spammy and you can unsubscribe at any time. I send one email a week on average. And then, like I said, upcoming events. And we do have this three-part series that's going to be phenomenal. So I appreciate your listening and take care and reach out if you have any questions. Talk soon.